Just um, by way of introdu introduction, everyone calls me JP, but my name is Jean-Paul Gaston and um, I've been with the council for 15 years and living in the city. Um, and, um, uh, all right, all right, thank you. Um, so, so really, one of this, this part of the session is really a look back, but um, one of the things that's really important to do is to say, look, what have been some of the significant periods in our past which actually have created uh, both an opportunity and a legacy for us to address as far as the development of the city is concerned. So um, I mentioned that I've been here for 15 years. I, I live in a home that was built in 1966, and, and it's built in a site that used to be a campground. So it's been part of that evolution of our city moving forward. Um, what we've got first up is really sort of, if we look back at a period from the 1950s through to, to really the end of the 1970s, we saw a period of, of, of quite significant and rapid growth across the city. So the reason why I'm saying that is often a lot of our suburbs and a lot of our infrastructure and a lot of our solutions were created at that time. So you take a time, for example, back through the 1950s, we had the Queen or Royals visit a couple of times uh, and they landed at an airport or an airstrip that was in Fenton Park. So that was in that mid to early 1950s. So it was through to about 1963, I think it was, when we saw the Rotorua reopen on the other side or, or east side of the lake. So, so what had been a perfectly logical solution in the 40s or the, through to the 50s was something that needed to change as the city grew and developed. And we talk about there about that population increase that was quite rapid between 1956 and 1976. And um, obviously then the, the picture from our archives there is the celebration document when the city was made, uh, well, became a city in 1962. So quite a rapid set of changes through that period. And, um, but as that growth period started to subside, and those who I, I look around the room will remember it more clearly than I would, um, some oil shocks in the late 70s. Uh, and that started to start developing a situation where as an economy, we started to see an increase in unemployment and started leading towards more of a recessionary space into the 80s. So moving forward then into that 1980s space, um, really there's some really dramatic events that occurred in that sort of 1980s period. And, and we've talked before and we've communicated it before that this was a regional centre for government and really that changed quite significantly in the 1980s. So Rogernomics uh, and some changes in government really saw a retrenching of a lot of the government departments, changes in the railways, uh, and some really quite significant changes to the city. Now we're fast forwarded to a situation where we have an extremely large CBD area, which was perfect when we were a regional centre for government and there was a lot of businesses and a lot of businesses done in a certain way. You move forward to large format retail and, and a lack of that regional businesses and we actually have an extremely large CBD. Compared with other centres like Napier or Hastings, we're probably two or three times the physical footprint of some of those CBDs. So again, one of our challenges for the development of the city. Superimposed on that is the challenge, of course, that when you've gone into a situation where there's low or no growth, it is hard to see that transformation and change. So a lot of those solutions I talked about being set in that period in the 50s to the 70s were not really changed and there was no drivers of change as you came into another 30 year period where there was very little change in the city. So a lot of the things that we see in the city have really been set and locked in place for uh, very long periods of time. So fast forward now to that period from about 2012, 2013, through to at least 2020, uh, where we saw some quite extensive and significant population increases again. Now, one of the interesting parts of this is how you respond to that. So as a city, when we had an extended period of time when there was zero to low growth, the number of developers who were producing or building homes in our city was very low. A lot of the tradespeople who are, who are working here or living here weren't working here. They would head down to Taupo or 
up to Tauranga, where there was growth and development. So actually our capacity to even respond to rapid growth has been quite limited. A, from our planning frameworks, which often lag quite a long way behind, and secondly, from the capacity to actually start responding and building homes in our communities. So that's really why, as a community, in that period, as population started to increase, the first reaction was, it's a blip. Um, we don't need to make any more zoned land available. We don't need to think about the capacity to build more homes. We don't need to start looking at different housing typologies. It's a blip. It's going to stop. Maybe that was okay as a statement for the first one, two, three, four years, but we've now had a period of at least seven years where we saw something like 13% population increase. So as a community, that's been one of the contributing factors of that period of stagnation, the lack of change, the lack of change in our capacity and our capability and our zoned land and even a, a, a belief in this community that it can grow has meant we were very slow to respond to an emerging housing crisis. So um, with all of these exercises though, it, it's an endless crystal ball gazing exercise because around the corner from about 2020, we start hitting that obvious problem of um, here comes COVID. We went through a series of, of managements around lockdowns and we've only recently moved into a different phase of the whole COVID environment. But just to put some extra pressure on, on us, um, someone started a war on the Ukraine. Now again, that starts having impacts on global markets that were already impacted, supply chain issues. So as a community, when we start to see that response to growth, start to see that demand and that need for a supply of homes, we run into some more headwinds. So inflation, supply chain issues, people to build homes, and, and some of those other challenges. So again, council's infrastructure, which again, as I said earlier, for some of it was rooted in solutions in the 50s, 60s and 70s, is a massive step change that's required to start being an effective, planned and enabled city to respond effectively to growth. And to actually start getting the people who are working in those other two cities back working here and building homes, or developing some more people to do that. Whilst at the same time, um, and it's a glib statement, you can't even find a piece of jib. So some real challenges in addressing homes. The other issue I think which is really important is you start seeing the challenges created by that lack of supply and unaffordability and the inability for people to find homes to meet their needs. So a real challenge for us as a community moving forward. So um, just to give you, a, a, there's a few slides I've got here which really give you a snapshot of the kind of challenge and crisis that we're currently in. So what we've got there is just a a piece there which talks about that population growth. So if you recall, in the previous slide I talked about us having, we had a surge of growth of about 4.8% between 1990 and 1996. But pretty much since 1996 to 2013, the net population change was almost zero. Until we started to hit 2013. So at that point we started to say, hey, we've, we've got a few bits of land zoned, and, and actually we don't have the infrastructure in place to support those. Oh, that's a problem for the developers to resolve. Well actually the knock-on problems for that almost made it unfeasible to see that development. So back at that time, and, and I've got some of my team here, we generally had a, had a view that there was four main developers in our city. And that's also a significant challenge when those four developers uh, have an opportunity or see a challenge if they don't move, things come to a halt. And again, we saw a very slow response to the challenges in housing we started to see. So this is the consequence. So that's the median house prices for our city. And what's not shown on that graph is it goes, that's from 2017. If you go back to where I started with that description of 2013, the median house price in our city in 2013 was 265000 We had a very low 
set of prices here because there was no demand. So when you look at the prices that existed in Tauranga and Taupo and other centres, we almost had outrageously cheap homes here. And to go with our outrageously cheap homes, we also had very cheap rents, which is something we really needed because actually as an economy, we have um, some people doing pretty well, but we actually have a lot of people and a lot of deprivation in our community, and we were lucky we had cheap housing because that made a big difference. You move forward and you start to see this kind of impact occur as that supply gets harder and harder to, to produce and the demand for that homes goes higher and higher and you start seeing people priced out of affording a home or priced out of rents. So that's been some of our challenges which have slowly snowballed to the crisis that we currently see ourselves in. So a couple more slides just to give you a sort of a, some of those stark figures and stark images of, of just how significantly things have changed over the last 10 or so years. So I talked about that population increase between 2013 and 2020. So quite significant there. So that was almost 9,000 people, so about 13%. Now when you reflect back for the previous 25 years, where the number was almost zero, that's a titanic shift. Now in that period as well, the, the government also saw the housing crisis build and build nationally. We have our unique set of circumstances, and I've just touched on a few of the elements of it, but nationally we were also moving towards a, a, a housing crisis. So one of the things we'll talk about later is that they, they wrote a bit of legislation called the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and they put in place some requirements for cities and urban areas that were growing at a medium rate or at a high rate to do some things, to start making land available and start changing their settings to enable housing to be built more quickly. And that's one of the drivers that we're talking about this evening and, and goes into a significant amount of work that we'll be touching on across the information series. So I've just talked about the population increase and I've talked then against that median house price change. So that huge shift, um, less of a shift on the rentals, but again that goes back to affordability. Now that's put a huge part of our community in a situation where they could not afford their housing or they're in a position where there's housing distress. Now housing distress is a situation where um, if you're spending more than 30% of your income, and, and for many people that was a fixed income, uh, on rent you're in a, in a situation where you are at risk. Housing risk is a, is a real challenge for you. So one of the things I wanted to highlight, and it's our hidden challenge as a community moving forward, is there's a lot of people talking about who's in emergency housing at the moment who they are, what they look like, um, whether they're here for the right reasons or not. But hidden away in our community, um, based on 2021 numbers from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, is 650 pensioners on a fixed income receiving the accommodation supplement, that's the AS there, um, who are already moving into that challenging space where their rents are making up a significant portion of their benefits. And, and I would put the, the comment back out there, and I think I'd be fairly honest in saying, that's a risk group who will be the next tranche of people in emergency housing. If we do not see the housing supply addressed and choices of housing that's affordable um, and opportunities for people to actually downsize, move, or with a decent supply, see rent increases starting to slow. So this is a really, really important step for us as a city as we evolve. How are we looking after all of our communities? So certainly there's a view of, of emergency housing recipients at the moment, but actually we've got some wider community issues we need to see addressed in, in our planning going forward. So I mentioned emergency housing. So um, whether you think there is 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% of people who aren't necessarily from our community, 
there is a lot of our community who have been displaced out of housing and are unfortunately stuck in a situation where they are in emergency housing. And, and that's the use of the motels. So no one would believe that is a good solution, um, but at the moment we do not have another solution. The other issue um, I think it's important to, to pick up on, and it does, does go back to some of the previous decisions as well. Um, when you look across our country, there is about 4% of the housing stock in New Zealand which is public housing. So that goes back to Housing New Zealand, the old state homes, so 4%. When you look at our city, we've got less than 2%. So again, that availability of public homes that would have supported people who needed housing through an emergency housing pipeline and into public housing, we've got a basic shortage from day one. So just to give you an idea of numbers, um, Kainga Ora, who's the replacement for the old state homes or housing New Zealand, they have about 750 public homes here. There's probably about another 150 by other community housing providers or other providers that are available. So really, if, if I was to take that view of that's about the 2% mark, we're about 1,000 public homes short, let alone have a conversation about emergency housing. So again, it's one of the challenges we've got as a community moving forward and why when we start talking about a housing plan, and I'll talk a bit more about it later, there is no silver bullet to making sure our community's got sufficient homes for its population, regardless of what your age, what your disposition is, um, and that is one of the big issues for us, as well as making sure that we are able to ensure we have thriving communities and sustainable communities from an environmental perspective. So, so some of those challenges you've heard from our history um, and our crisis that we're in now has led to a lot of the work that we're doing and you've heard that we'll be talking and getting talks from our partners who can give you that kind of granularity about some of those challenges of making sure we've got a Te Aro perspective into our housing solutions and our chance for housing development moving forward. We've got a really clear view of the environmental implications, whether that's from a Te Arawa perspective around lake water quality, or equally then from a climate resilience perspective. Some of that infrastructure that was put in place in the 1950s, 60s and 70s is woefully inadequate for the weather shifts, the greater severity and the greater frequency of storms and, and weathers that we're starting to see. So hence some of those flooding challenges we see repeated every two or three years. That infrastructure is not fit for purpose with the kind of environmental change we're starting to see. Now you start projecting that forward and we need to start anticipating and planning for that. So that infrastructure challenge is one that's very, very clear as we need to start at responding to homes. We need to make sure we've got the infrastructure to support that. The other piece too, just in that slide, is just talking about the demand for the type of homes. So you can see there, one bedrooms, so the vast remote majority of people in emergency housing uh, need that one bedroom unit. So it's not quite all doom and gloom, there is some glimmers. So one of those is actually starting to see a really clear market response. So we've been trying to work with developers and landowners to bring on more homes and more housing and also encourage them to start looking at different types of homes. So you can start seeing there that the market is starting to respond um, and equally when I talked earlier about having four developers who are interested in seeing developments or doing developments in our city, we're now seeing something like 25 to 30 that are looking at saying, hey, this is a great place to see those opportunities to put some new housing types in place or invest to see some development. Um, probably also goes back to the profitability considering our house price position as well. So I talked briefly about the government's requirements under a national policy statement on urban development. One of those was to do uh, a lot of work around confirming or getting the evidence about our housing demand. So that's called a housing and business uh, capacity assessment, an HBA. 
So that was one of the requirements for us to have completed last year. Uh, and what that sets out is we have to start identifying how many homes are required now and if there's a deficit. And um, I think hopefully you've taken away from my slides to date, we have a housing deficit. Uh, and we have to start looking at what kind of capacity we need in the way of homes to respond to that future growth. So whatever that growth projections are, how many more homes do we need to meet our needs? So catch up on our deficit and then start making sure that we're not in the same situation again. So whilst we may see the cycles come and go, we actually have to start planning, putting the infrastructure in place and making sure we've got the capacity so that we can respond if the direction's up or if the direction's down. Very easy to go down, not so hard to go up. Uh, and we've seen that with how much of a lag there's been. So, so one of the key things about those planning requirements was to start saying, you need to start getting ahead. You need to start planning, making sure you've got enough zoned land and enough enabled land with infrastructure that's fit for purpose to make sure that homes can be built. And you also need to start looking at the types of homes and start encouraging people to start thinking about um, an ageing population, um, smaller family sizes, and a whole range of other issues. So building three and four bedroom homes is not the answer within that. So one of the other things we've got identified through that housing and business assessment is two thirds of our homes over the next 10 years need to be in the one or two bedroom size. And that really reflects the changing demographics, age and composition of families moving forward. So that's a real opportunity for us to actually start putting some different housing types in place that people genuinely need moving forward. And I think this again, with our lack of growth for, for so long, we've, there's evidence of that kind of housing in Hamilton and Tauranga and Taupo, uh, and certainly up in Auckland as you start catering to different sizes of families and, and also more importantly different price points so that they are accessible to people. So those numbers aren't cumulatively so um, just, just to be clear by 2050 we saw a little decrease in the, in the population growth so we need to be able to make sure that there's available land to enable us to have approximately 10,000 homes, 6,000 homes by 2030 um, and in the short term still to try and address our deficit, we need to see that encouragement of housing and home development quite rapidly. Very difficult as we move into a different phase of headwinds of um, you know, building supplies and, and interest rate changes, so real challenging. So I, I think our challenges are here for a bit longer than the three year horizon. So if I just go back to, to what we're talking about here, is, is, is one of the, the real key drivers for us is um, that this is a really important time in the development of our city and our district, and it's one that we actually need to include as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, to make sure that we can start really thinking about making sure there's access to homes that meet people's needs and their changing circumstances moving forward. And we also need to make sure that we're putting in place infrastructure solutions to make sure those homes are safe uh, and we're starting to address some of those climate issues we're seeing coming around the corner. So this is a really important time and um, again some of the timetables that we're required to meet through that national policy statement are actually driving some really quick and, and rapid discussions that need to occur within our community. So there is a lot on and, and I think for some people they may not see how the different pieces connect together. So what I'll do in the next couple of slides is just talk to how we're bringing all those different pieces together. So last year we, we adopted a, a homes and thriving community strategy. So whilst you've heard me talk about homes, one of the other really important things that we need to make sure we've, is that we've got thriving, connected uh, and, and communities that, that are great places to live. So a really important piece to, to not forget. So when we did the homes and thriving community strategic framework uh, with Tiarawa and government, and talk to a lot of providers and community groups, those were some of the issues that really came into, into play here. So it's not just about building enough houses, we need to make sure that we have good 
effective communities. So that means public transport solutions that work, good reserve networks that meet the needs of those communities and, and can absorb a higher density of housing or new types of housing. That there's the range of those housing types I've talked about and there's a character and a place. So some of that place making stuff is really important in, in that discussion as well. So I'll go a bit slower on this because this is the, the first slide that actually brings together quite a bit of content around the council's housing plan. So we've got sort of five themes across the top there and really they've come out of a, a view of planning longer term, so that's almost a, a view of the left side of the screen, through to the, the urgent issue that's happening now around emergency housing. So sort of five main themes of work in the housing strategy for our community going forward. So the first one there is our plan our way forward framework. Now I've mentioned that not national policy statement on urban development. So one of the things that comes out of that was a requirement for us as a medium growth and, and now a tier two council to put in place an intensification plan change. So from a, from a city development perspective, and, and probably Auckland's the place where this has played out more, cities tend to sprawl and everyone wants to build greenfield. So um, Tauranga is our classic example where there was very little infill, it was all outfill. Um, and so Papamoa is a classic example. So probably up until a few years ago, uh, greenfield development versus infill, so keeping a compact city form, was something like 95% greenfields to about 5% infill. For cities, that's not sustainable. And, and Auckland is a, is a classic example now where they're having to turn back in and say, how do we get more people living closer in to the city and make sure we've got the public transport networks and the, and the places to support that. So similar sort of challenges for us. So as a tier two council uh, that's covered by that national policy statement on urban development, we need to start looking at how we enable more homes to be built in the current footprint of our city. Uh, we've also put our hand up and say, well, actually our district plan that had been rolled over and the provisions rolled over for decades was not fit for purpose. So where other cities had grown more quickly and introduced more housing types, ours had lagged behind because there wasn't the demand. So we'd put our hands up with government to say, actually, we're interested in being involved in the medium density residential standards. So that's another part which needs to be included within that intensification plan change. So the, that national policy statement on urban development gives us a deadline of when we need to notify that plan change. And that's in August of this year. So some of the team are here today and there's been an intense amount of work going into starting to prepare what that intensification plan change might look like and engaging with mana whenua, with te Arawa more broadly, with land trusts, with community groups, with developers, uh, and investors to say this is what we're looking at as far as the plan change is concerned. So uh, when it's notified, the community will also get the chance to more formally through a district plan process make submissions on it. So that's coming from August. <clears throat> Another requirement for us is to say okay well that, that takes care of a discussion about infill and, and getting more people into the current city's footprint. But actually you need to start thinking more long term. So the other part of the requirements under that national policy statement is you need to start doing a future development strategy. Now a few years ago we did a spatial plan that starts saying, hey, new greenfield growth or opportunities for development are here, here and here. Um, we need to run that exercise again and at a, at a level where we're just doing a new longer term strategic view of land availability for future development. Now that will set a work program for subsequent years. So we've got the immediate plan change about intensification, but that future development strategy will start talking about are there any new areas of the, of the district, greenfield areas, so new and literally greenfields, um, that could be or should be future uh, extensions of our current townships or new townships. 
So some of those challenges are, are also hitting some of those other councils in the Bay of Plenty who, who are suffering probably larger problems than us. So we've actually got this really important time now to start thinking about how we accommodate growth. And as I said earlier, regardless of where we are in a cycle, we need to get ready for the next one. So if we're not ready for it, we, we get caught behind the eight ball and we get the kind of crisis that we've now seen, where the capacity and the supply can't meet demand as we grow or change. So really important to that. The other piece there was Papakainga. Um, huge amounts of, of land in our district is Māori, multiply owned Māori land. So the ability to develop um, leasehold property is really important. And equally, the mix of Papakainga, whether that's urban or rural, is another really important opportunity for us as a community to start addressing our, our planning needs moving forward. So a lot of that, as I said, was driven by our requirements, so council must do. The next bit there starts picking up on some of the other changes, which is sort of our build our way forward. So I talked about that response from the market. We got a really positive response from developers who are starting to put in place more subdivisions and starting to build more homes. We've actually now got a dedicated team within council who's there to keep encouraging more developers to see the opportunities and to see a roadmap of how they can bring on uh, a more of supply of homes, whether that's in the CBD area as apartments, uh, greenfield or redevelopment of current sites. So a team dedicated to sort of working with landowners, matching them up with envelop in investors or that kind of consultant support to try and boost our supply of homes because we so desperately need it. Pokahangi. Now, some of you are aware that the above Pokahangi Road, that area there, which is sort of Sumner Hunt Farms heading down towards Matapo, has been rezoned for um, residential development. One of the challenges we've got, and it goes to this legacy of stormwater management, is that we need to put in place a really comprehensive set of plans around stormwater management because we have real flooding risks around the Mangakakahi and Utahina streams. So putting more homes further up the caldera is a real challenge to streams that are already under pressure from the style of infrastructure that was built in those 50s, 60s and 70s, where those streams were used as the drain to get the water to the lake. So that's one of our major problems. So, so some of that work now is making sure that eight or 900 homes that could be built up across Pukahangi uh, are done in a way where the stormwater can be properly managed to not create additional risks and challenges of flooding down into the, into the city. So that's underway. Um, a hot topic for a lot of people is we looked at our open space policy. So we've looked at what reserves we have and we've got a network of something like 370 reserves. Are they good reserves? Are they being used? Are they being effective? So there's been a bit of a discussion that's going on at the moment about are those reserves best or should we consider whether there's a housing option on a few of them and whether that money should be invested back into the network. So again, it's an opportunity to say how do we get the best out of our network assets and treating our reserves like another network asset for us. Um, and more recently we've also done some work through Rotary Economic Development about trying to get some exemplar developments around apartments or apartment developments in the city. So they're proceeding on those at the moment. So that's another bit about trying to get that immediate build response while we go through a lot of work around the planning requirements. The third category there goes to a couple of issues I've signalled, which is we have a legacy of infrastructural challenges. So in the past, um, you, you know, you can see I, I didn't raise any of them, but things like we used to have tips everywhere. Um, eventually we ended up with something positive called a landfill, uh, which is now closed as well. But um, one of the development challenges we've got for a number of um, developers thinking, hey, there's a piece of bare land, is that often it was used for a t as a tip at some stage in the past, and, and that's a real challenge for us. So landfills, wastewater, you know, it wasn't so long ago that we had a, a, a terrible history of, of putting wastewater straight into the lake, which led to the development of the wastewater treatment plant and spray, spray irrigation up in the forest. So, so those things have changed. Roading improvements are starting to come, 
but probably our biggest issue, and I'll, and I'll continue to repeat it, is stormwater and the, the challenges of climate resilience and addressing the ability to infill and, and reduce those stormwater risks. So um, at the moment, and I've got some numbers up there, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in the midst of, of the first COVID lockdown, we applied to some government funding, we received 55 million. 35 of, of that was to be directed at um, improving Tenai Road, so um, Waka Kotahi have been working on that now for a couple of years. The other 20 million was to support stormwater solutions for the Wharanui block, so out on the east side, um, up a, at the top of Wharanui Road. There's, a, there's an area there of between 1,000 and 1,200 homes, so uh, 15 million of that was to go into helping with stormwater solutions for that area, and another 5 million to do um, to do roading network changes. Um, and just recently, we've applied to another fund to, for 99 million to start really addressing the stormwater challenges we have across the central part of the city and the western part of the city that I've alluded to. Uh, and, and again, this talks to the speed of things that we're having to do at the moment. Tomorrow, um, our councillors will be considering a development contributions policy. So one of the challenges we've got is growth paying for the increase in capacity of our infrastructure created by that growth. So that's a private benefit. Uh, otherwise, that cost of increasing the capacity of our wastewater treatment plants, our stormwater networks, our water supplies, uh, falls back on our existing ratepayers. Now, just um, I'll go a bit more quickly through the last couple of areas. Thriving communities, so we talked about saying, actually, we need to do some locality planning. Um, there's been a Tatu Panamu group who've done an east side plan, which is marvellous. So they've got a view of what they would like their community to be like. So that gives us the chance to say, other than homes, other than the core infrastructure, what else do we need to create a thriving community? So um, that east side collective has been leading that process. So we want to do that across the rest of the city uh, and Nongataha. And um, probably the last one there is also us having to, to put our shoulder to the wheel and work with government about how we can Im improve the really poor outcomes we have at the moment around emergency housing. So uh, at the great tourism pivot for our accommodation providers was to emergency housing and providing that spaces there. Uh, we've been to government in the past to say, hey, they are unsafe. Uh, and so hence the government contracted and are going through a consenting process on 13, focused on making sure families are safe. But actually, again, this is only a short-term solution. Um, and at the moment, we're starting a regulatory approach with the other 40 to 50 motels that are providing accommodation for emergency housing. With the recognition that there's nowhere for these people to go afterwards. So one of the things we have to do with government is say, how do we get more public homes being built in our city? So that's our housing plan. Uh, it's got quite a few dimensions to it. As I said, there's a lot of work going into planning and some immediate responses around development contributions and the discussions around reserves and, and are there are some that could be better used for other uses. So that's the kind of primary and short term focus whilst we take a longer term view about improving our infrastructure. So as I said, the, the talks over the next 10 weeks give you the chance to hear from the experts who are helping us um, and to drive into some of those issues and challenges that I've just skimmed across at the moment. So I think on that basis, I think that was pretty much us. Um, and we're really open for questions now if there's any.